Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're broadcasting from the Thomas K. McKeon Center for Creativity, and I'm your host, Corey D. Taylor. My guest today is none other than Montre Tisdale Johnson. He is part of the famed family, the Tisdales. If you want to know what it's like to preserve that legacy, well, you come to the right place, so stay tuned because this is Up Close with Corey Taylor. Hello and welcome back. Thank you for joining us. We are here with none other than music, gospel music impresario, Montre Tisdale Johnson. How are you, man? I'm doing good, man. How are you? Man, I'm doing great. Well, we got some young energy in the building. Yes, like, sir. look at you. You all decked out. You got your fly look and all of that stuff. Oh, so man, let me ask you this question. Going. What have you been up to, man? I have been doing the most, man. I'm working still further in my music career and doing my youth or youth and young adult organization, traveling, doing that. Um, I'm currently gearing up for my second live recording project. Wow, man. So you just been out here grinding because I know when you came to my attention, you we had had a conversation and um, um, Tony Estes had yes. kind of told you about what we were doing here yes. and um, with the show and everything. And it was a pleasure to have her. And yeah. then when she recommended you and, and, and all of that stuff, I was like, man, we got to get this guy on the show. And then when I got a chance to talk to you, you were like Tisdale. And I was like, wait a minute. Are you some kid in the way, man? Tisdale, ah. you like that's that's my family, that's my uncle, and I'm like, what? I'm like, so yeah. that was a question that was asked to Wayman when he was out on the road one time. He was doing an interview in the morning, mm -hmm. and then they's like, man, how much talent can one person have between playing basketball, playing music, and everything? But what most people don't understand is the Tisdale name. Mm -hmm. There's just a plethora of oh, talent man. in the family. Period. Man. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I mean, you have a cousin that sings with Kurt Franklin. Yes. You know, you. Yeah. Had Wayman, yes. you have Wayman's daughter, one who's a chef, that's yes. Tiffany, and she has the company 23, yes. and you got Danielle, who is a designer yes. and, and a, a phenomenal singer. I she had is. her um, Whenever You Pray, that song that her Uncle dad Wayman's did. out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 21 and, Day Record. Yeah. When I heard that, man, I was just <laughs> like, man, and her voice is so smooth, but yes. then here it is. We get to learn that the talent continues wow. in you. To God so be the talk glory. to me a little bit about what was your journey like and why when when Wayman did 21 Days, which was his gospel music, but he was known for jazz. Mm -hmm. Then you have the cousin that sang with Kurt Franklin. Then Tiffany, she was working and writing R and B. But yeah. what made you say in a in a uh, what is not a mainstream genre of music yet is quickly rising like gospel music. What made you do gospel music? Uh, my choice for doing gospel music is I wanted to impact my generation in a new way. I want to do it a non-traditional way. I want to do it with a funky beat. I want to do it with dance moves. I wanted to do it with the um, fitted ball caps, the gold chains with swag. And I wanted to reach the um, people that wouldn't normally come to the church environment. Those are the people I wanted to write music for. And I wanted to reach the hearts of those young people. Now that, that reminds me because my friend Willie Moore Jr. who is a, um, yeah. he's got a syndicated radio show and I used to work with him on the road he has the young fly and save movement and yes. the one thing that how old he is he was like he is not getting rid of those hats like he was like i'll make music for <laughs> no, the people man. in the street that and same thing I, i'm gonna make music for them so that they will know that you know doing gospel music and he calls Absolutely. his kingdom music but he has the same swaggy Absolutely. little feel that you have like i see you the gold hat on the gold <laughs> chains gold watch you rocking yes, all of the nice gear you i mean you got the young person swag yes, so sir. how influential have you been going down this road wanting to work with young people and bringing this genre of gospel music to them um it's been um uh, it's been a journey of course um with the times evolving and different things like that with the church you know not you got the older saints they were why you gotta do it this way why you gotta dress like that in the church why you gotta wear the hats why you gotta wear the gold chain why you gotta wear the skinny jeans um so the my biggest challenge has been stepping out and knowing that this is what God wants me to do and sticking to it. You know, so this is who I am, so you got to take me for who I am, and this is just it. So that's been um, the, the biggest challenge coming from the older, the older saints and how they did music and different things before, and now involving into the new generation and, and 
bringing those young things in. The, wow. Yeah. You know, because that's interesting because in a time where we see so much crazy stuff going on in the world, yeah. you know, we are starting to see television programs, everyone, they are starting to bring in this conversation of, let me say it for the lack of, you know, um, spirituality. You yeah. know, they're trying to bring and implement more of that. And I'm hearing you say that, listen, we have a generation of young people that pretty much don't really know which way they should exactly. go and how to conduct themselves and you're like hey i'm young mm -hmm. so who better to talk to them than me exactly. so but you doing it in gospel music man so <laughs> let me share this with our viewers so they'll know sure. you won the verizon competition with yes. your, your with your choir it's yeah. called the it's called tell us the thing because it got how sweet the sound yeah yes. yes but your your group is the corral why the friends, friends corral. corral right like what did you come <laughs> up with the friends corral because that, that, I'm, I'm thinking like a corral of yeah. like cowboys but why the corral friends the corral. corral is um a vision that god gave me for youth and young adults that come from various backgrounds they've dealt with suicide depression low self-esteem parent incarceration uh, some of them have been abandoned, hurt. Some of them were raised by grandparents. Some of them don't even know who their um, biological parents are. So I created the Friends Corral, a group of friends who come together in unity as one to transform a nation through song and the gifts that God has given us. All right, but let me go back a little bit because sure. I just heard you say you were working with all of the various kids from different backgrounds, but you're not a stranger to the background of having what you've gone through your personal journey. Share a little bit about what that's been like. Sure, um, of course, growing up in a single parent home uh, with my mother and um, my grandmother to raise me and that kind of thing, um, I dealt with a lot of depression and suicide. You know, my father was incarcerated. He wasn't necessarily in my life. So that left me around just my uncles, you know, and just my immediate family, you know, without a father figure. So I had many, many, many challenges, you know, within myself, um, low self-esteem, you know, I needed validation from different people, you know, so I always was searching for hope in other people, you know, and that kind of thing. So finally got to the point to where I'm like, okay, God, I really need you to deliver me and I need you to show me my identity and help me to be content with who I am and love who I am, you know, um, a lot of times people tell me, you just, you're going to be just like your daddy. You're going to be just like your father. And I believed those things for a long time, man. I right. really believed those things like, wow, so I'm going to mess up like my father. I'm going to be a drug dealer like my dad. I'm going to walk in the same footsteps as my father. But God really showed me that we're not necessarily who our parents are, you know what I'm saying? Right. Even though we come from our parents, but we have the decision to reverse the curse and birth something new in our bloodline. So even though my dad was a drug dealer and he made his own decision, that didn't necessarily mean I was gonna be the same thing. Right, cause a lot of times were. people get that confused because they think that if you're, and, 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 and here's, let me just go there. Yeah. Because a lot of times people make the excuses Man. and they will say, because my dad wasn't in my life or my mom yes. wasn't in my life then, you know, and I've done a lot of youth type activities to help young people and what I used to tell those young people because people don't really know my story you know mm -hmm. my biological dad who um, I only met him a couple of times in my lifetime but he died last year well wow. he died from five different forms of cancer but it was a result of him being a, dr a long-term drug addict from heroin to wow. all type of drugs and so the thing is that when my mom typically raised me and I had stepdads, but you know, a lot of people used to say that to me. They was like, you're going to end up nothing. You're going to end up nowhere. I can remember sitting in high school and the people told me, they said, you're either going to jail, you're going to end up dead, or you're mm. going to be a loser, or you're going to be a bum. Wow. And you know, and, and I start internalizing that stuff, just like you said. And now I realize, and I've learned that you're right. It has what your parents do, you know, if you choose to adopt what they're doing, then mm -hmm. that will be your path. But exactly. you can do different, as in your case. So how has that, um, that you, you know, dad being locked up and everything, and you was like, I'm, you know, um, was trying to, you know, be different things and, and looking for approval in other people. What, what was the turning point for you? Turning point for me was 
constantly being depressed. It's like I have to make a change. I have to come up with a concept in a way to where I, I'm not constantly depressed or I'm constantly trying to harm myself or, you know, in this state of emergency in my own life, if you will. So I decided that I was going to start an organization called MTJ Ministries, which was a nonprofit organization. And from that, I birthed a three day youth conference to where I was going to impact a three day youth conference where I was going to impact, I was going to talk on the topics of depression, parent incarceration, and the different things that we deal with as, as youth and young adults. And I was going to use my life struggles and different things that I've dealt with to transform these youth and those different things. Now that's unusual because here it is, you're 25 years old yes, sir. and you've been not just doing, this is not something just for our viewers to know, this is not something you just came up with exactly. overnight. You've been doing this for some years now yeah. because it's in order for you to get on this show, it's taken us almost a year to get you here on the show. Yes, and I want our viewers to understand this. You're not just here because of the name Tisdale. Mm -hmm. It's just, amazing that that is the legacy that you follow in but man you have done some pretty powerful stuff you know right. i got we're going to roll in some footage and stuff but man from the verizon competition to getting gospel music awards yes. to working with top gospel music artists um let me i'm gonna say a couple of them you know but <laughs> shirley caesar yes. karen clark shears daughter kiki shears any like, come on man give us some more like it's a Jonathan ton of Nelson. Jonathan Nelson, yeah. and then you actually got a live concert coming up, and who's going to be there? Bishop Carlton Pearson, yes. um, Lillian Lloyd will be there, Travis Malloy, uh, so many phenomenal. I'm actually on this record, man. This is my most exciting part. Jay Moss is actually going to be on this record. Jay Moss. Now, for yes. people that don't know Jay Moss in the gospel music arena jay moss is part of legendary gospel family the yes. the, the, the clarks. clarks yeah and then you have maddie moss clark exactly. and all of them so when you think about jay moss you think about pajam you exactly. think about all of them you ain't know i knew it did you you ain't know i knew it all yes, right sir. so yeah so pajam and so to have jay moss on there but it seems like you've taken all of this negative experience and this is good for our young people to understand because with all of the negative stuff you went through, you could have said, you know what, I'm done and I'm going to throw my hands up. But you haven't done that. You have taken all of this negativity and all of the down um, times in your life and you reversed all of that. Mm -hmm. And now you're doing stuff to reach out and help other people. But you have become successful wow. in gospel music. And just like your family, you're a very humble guy, God, you know, cool. but... <laughs> How did you get to the point that you start working with these big name gospel artists? Because there are a lot of people that would want to do what you're doing. Um, I must first say that it, a lot of it was the legacy that my uncle Wayman paved and my uncles, Pastor Weldon Tisdale, and coming from a musical family, you know, and already into the industry. And of course, in my family, you either go play basketball or you go do music. <laughs> right, right. You go play sports. Exactly. Right? You go dribble a ball or you go do music. So um, for me, my decision was music. You know, so I started music back in 2012. I did my first CD, which is my inaugural CD coming out as an artist. You know, I came out with my group. I did my own thing. Um, Jonathan Nelson was on that record, my first record. From there, we went on God Bless. We performed at the Stella Awards. We were able to do Bishop Walker's um, Choir Fest. We was on the Word Network. And from there, God blessed it. And here we are now working on our second record. And that's awesome because when, because so mainstream people will know what the Stella Awards are. Are. Absolutely. Like that's like our Grammys. That's yes. like big. Like yes. that's that's gospel music, yes. not Christian music, but it's gospel, gospel music, music. You know, exactly. and that's where you have the Kurt Franklins, you have the Fred Hammonds. Exactly. You know, you Top have all of these and, people yes. that have been mainstream. What have taken gospel music into the mainstream, like a Kurt Franklin, and that's the kind of vein you follow in. Mm -hmm. You're like a conductor and a maestro of gospel music. So what made you go that route versus just wanting to be just a recording artist? I felt that I, I always um, admired Kurt Franklin. You know, how he was able to do the moonwalk on stage and tour it around. And um, I always thought that if there was a way that I can pattern that, but make it authentic and make it my own. So I came up with that concept, man, and it's been working for me. 
Wow. And here's the thing. You had to show heavy leadership because what people don't understand is when you look at Kurt Franklin, they may think he's just up there conducting and doing yeah. stuff like that. But, you know, Kurt is conducting, he's directing, yes. he's writing, he's composing, mm -hmm. you know. And so when people hear about a Kurt Franklin, they don't understand all of what goes into a gifts. person like a um, Kurt Franklin and you bringing those similar things to the table. So how were you able to convince a bunch of young people <laughs> to follow you down this road because you're 25 now, but you started in 2012, but you obviously have been a music artist. How do you get a bunch of people to follow you? Because a lot of people probably would want to know how do you create a, 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 a choir, if you will, mm -hmm. and how did you do it? Um, did auditions, you know, I had some people from church, I had some people from high school, I had some different soloists in the city that I went out, when I would go out different places, I'm like, wow, that voice would be perfect in my alto section, that voice would be perfect in my tennis section, her energy is on like 180, so I just got those people together, developed a rehearsal, put it together, and it became an amazing project. Wow, and so, did, do you have any older people in, in the group? Surprisingly, man, almost all of them are, it's very few that are 25. Some of them are, I think the oldest may be like 40. Really? And the youngest may be in high school. And they just it. follow. And they just follow. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I need to probably take some leadership <laughs> lessons from you because okay. the thing is, is that a lot of times when you think about leadership now, you know, people always sell themselves short because if they're younger, they don't think people will follow them if yeah. they're older. But you're proving something totally different. Mm -hmm. And so I want to go back a little bit when you were talking and I was asking you about how did you get in contact with these artists? Who was the first big name artist that you actually kind of the most notable artist? Who was the first one that you actually worked um, with? I would say it was Kier Sheard, which is uh She's kind of like me. She hails from the Clark family, uh, just like I hail from the Tisdale family. And I brought her one year from my conference. And from there, um, God blessed it. She made me the organization leader uh, for the Oklahoma chapter for her organization, BRL, which is Bold Right Life, her organization. And from there, we developed a relationship and we kept in contact and then God blessed it. Wow. And so what it was, so has there, has, I know you're humble, <laughs> but has there ever been a moment where you just said, um wow like i'm really in the heart of gospel music i'm not trying to get in i'm not on the outskirts but i'm in the thick of it because you know any person that watches this that knows about music or gospel music when you have worked with the type of people from shirley caesar now to jay moss to jonathan nelson to um karen to the clark sisters and their, their offspring mm -hmm. like was there ever a time that you said I'm right here in the heart of it. Mm -hmm. What was that like when you realized that? Um, man, when I first realized that, when I first realized that I was in the heart of it and doing what I dreamed of doing, it brought tears to my eyes, you know, because I never would have thought that I would be in the place that I'm in today because I never felt good enough. Wow, because I never felt coming good from enough. what you just shared with us right now mm -hmm. in your background, you never felt good enough. I never felt good enough. And so how did you overcome that? I just jumped out there. I just jumped out there. I said, um, there comes a time where you just have to jump into it and have faith. You know, faith is the, is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So I just developed the mindset, I'm just going to try it. What else can happen other than you fail? Right. And this is what's amazing about you. You're a very <laughs> soft-spoken guy. And from the time that I've been talking to you on the phone, I was like, this guy is so soft-spoken. And so how does your leadership come across with you being soft-spoken? Because when we typically hear about leadership, we're thinking about people that are aggressive and raising yeah. their voice and acting crazy. Yeah. And then people are like, oh, my God, we're going to listen. But you're, <laughs> you're very soft-spoken. So does that? how does that translate into leadership? I have my moments where I transition, you know, into my leadership role where I'm very straightforward, you know, and I believe that every leader has that, you know, that time where they have to stand up and like, look, this is what it is, you know. Um, but for the most part, I'm kind of a low key guy and people, they don't try me too much. You know, they right. pretty, they pretty much take me at my word and that's it. So. Wow. Yeah. So when you did your first project, mm -hmm. what was that like for you? Oh man, it was mind blowing. Um, 
again, I was at that place. I'm a very emotional person, you know, when I look back on look at things that God has graced me and been able to do and look at who my family is and the favor that God has placed me in, you know, placed upon my life. I, um, I get emotional, you know, so when I was working on my first record, I got the call, you know, that Jonathan Nelson accepted my invitation to be on my first record, man. It was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. I was excited. I was nervous, you know, because that, that was my first actual CD and coming out as an artist. I'm like, wow, how's the world going to look at you? Know, how are they going to receive it? You know, my first songs coming out, you know, on actual CD and going to stores, you know, will people buy it? And surprisingly, people supported it. And God took it to a whole nother level. And from there, we were able to have many opportunities that we wouldn't have been able to happen if we didn't record that first record. Wow. So tell me this. What was one of the most memorable moments for you in your career? Um, and, and not as if your career is over, because it's, right. there, you, you've actually conquered a lot of territory that most people at 25 haven't even done in the music industry. But give us a moment to this point that's been like a a moment of awe where working with someone or whatever the case may be. I would say performing at the Stella Awards, doing the Stella Award weekend, um, when we actually performed my title track, I'm Alive, you know, in front of well over 5,000 people, you know, for Bishop Hezekiah Walker's Choir Fest. It was a phenomenal experience to walk out on the stage and then be introduced by Stella Award winner Jonathan Nelson. Wow. Yeah, so it was it was a phenomenal thing and it was just like, wow, this is really happening. Okay, so in your journey, your journey, who are some of the people that you look up to and who have influenced you? Um, it will first be my uncles. Pastor Weldon Tisdale, my uncle Danny and my uncle Will, you know, of course they're men of God and I I admire them, you know, um when I look at them, they're like heroes to me. You know what I'm saying? They got the beautiful wives. They got the nice homes, the nice <laughs> cars. They got the beautiful wives. They got the they nice homes. And they do. And they, they got do. the beautiful wives and they do and have they the do. nice homes. Yes. Um, Kurt Franklin, you know, he's one of my influential. And then my favorite idol is Ricky Diller. Okay. Ricky Diller. That's my idol. Um, The high energy. You know, how he can do all the dance moves on stage, the amazing <laughs> choir, the choreography, the stage. So that's, those are some of my idols. Because when you're up there doing your performance, as we'll roll some footage, mm -hmm. when you're doing your performance, like you said, it is high energy. It is yeah. not this low brow like energy where it's like we're going to be traditional. Right. It's like we're trying to reach a different segment of the world, mm -hmm. which is a younger generation. And they respond very well to high energy type Absolutely. things. OK, so when you have been out here in your travels and things of that nature, who has been one of your favorite artists to work with? With. My favorite artist to work with um, would be a guy named Professor Craig Hayes out of Trenton, New Jersey. Wow. He's phenomenal. He's actually um, one of the minister of music for Bishop Hezekiah Walker at um, the Love Fellowship Church. And the way he flows and his stage presence and his dynamics, the way he works with choirs and singers and brings the sound out of it, man, it is phenomenal. It's like you could tell it's a heaven set and it's a God given talent. Wow. So the um, every year I have the every summer I go to um, a different city and we have like a training with the Gospel Music Worship of America. And he takes these directors under his wing and he actually gives us knowledge and wisdom and praise for us, give us structure, criticism, things we could work on better and different things like that. So that is the most influential time um, that I've had with him is Professor Craig Case. Now. In all of what you're doing, because with the rise of the internet and people becoming um, famous over the internet, and a lot of times people think that, oh, if I get on the internet, I'll be a success overnight. And you know, I was talking to Mr. Jim Halsey, legendary maestro himself, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, impresario of country music, as well as managing like mega stars in country mm -hmm. music. He said a lot of times when you think that a person has been an overnight success, they've already been in it a long time. It's just that they right. have made it to the masses. So, so in your journey, how important has your education been mm -hmm. to lend to what it is that you're doing? Um, it's been very influential. You know, I believe that the way the industry is now, and everybody's not going to make it. 
You know what I'm saying? So I believe that it's important to have something to fall back on, to have education, to have a trade, if you will, whether it's welding, whatever your hobby is, to have some kind of education to fall back on the work. You have to go do an eight to five. You're able to go do an eight to five. Because most people wouldn't know this about you, but when I first started talking with you, you had a nine to five job. Absolutely. You had a nine to five. Working and I used to be like, car. man, when you gonna come on the show? And you was like, dude, I gotta work. I'm like, no, <laughs> dude, you are a superstar in gospel music on the rise. He was like, but I got to go to work. <laughs> I got to go to work. I got to go to work. But that's changed over the last year now it where is. you are actually um, able to be here now exactly. and do other things. And so for young people watching this and viewing this, um, they need to know mm -hmm. that. And I've had my friend, my big brother, um, Bill Hagens, Dr. Bill oh, wow. Hagens, who is a triple platinum producer. He said this to me, like people always want to quit what they're doing before they have pay dues to see if what they want to do is it's actually going to pan benefit. out. And so speak to that for a minute. Oh, whew. I will first say, make sure that you're going to have some income before you stop your day job. <laughs> <laughs> Man, make sure you go have some income because I mean, a lot of times we uh, people always say all the time, go chase your dream. Yeah, chase your dream, but make sure you're going to have some income. Because you got to survive. Because you got to survive. At the end of the day, you got rent, you got water. You know, some people got kids. You got different things, you know, car payment, different things like that. So I'm, I tell people all the time, you know, don't quit your day job. Make sure you have some income, steady income, where you can still live and do things that you need to do from a day-to-day -day basis before you fully do whatever it is that you're called to do. Right. So this show, Up Close with Corey Taylor, it is all about us, you know, helping people to understand what it would take to be successful and you yourself going through all of the different things that you've gone through, through depression. Yes, sir. Dealing with your dad being incarcerated, you know, um, dealing with loneliness, mm -hmm. you know, f um, growing up with, you know, not having a father, father figure because, see, a person can have a parent that's incarcerated, but to understand that there is not a man in your life, because that's what I heard you say, mm -hmm. you know, not having that father figure, you know, you got uncles and everything, but I know what you're talking about because exactly. I had stepdads and everything, but um, I still felt alone as a young man because there was no, not someone to call my own as my exactly. dad, you know, so this show is all about helping to um, let people understand what it would take to go on and be successful. So in your own words, mm -hmm. what do you think in any facet of life, what do you think it takes for a person to go on and be successful? I would first say you have to, it takes hard work. You have to want to work. Nothing's going to happen overnight and you have to write the vision, make it plain. You have to stick to it and you have to come up with a plan and a concept. How can I execute this? You know, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to do it. And give yourself a timeline. You know, by this time, I want this accomplished. By this time, I need this done. I need this amount of money in the bank before I get to this month. By the end of 2017, I want to be half a million. You have to have steps and goals and come up with the concept of how I'm going to do things. And you have to work on that daily. You have to work on a daily. Well, Mondre, so much wisdom at a young age, man. Wow. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed our show today. I would like to thank my guest, Mondre Tisdale Johnson, for joining us. Think about this. Change is inevitable, but your attitude towards that change, remember, it is always optional. Until next time, keep looking forward.